Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Friday afternoon. Um, this is Anna Norton. I am the Operations Manager for Diabetes Sisters, um, and I'll be moderating today's webinar, A Woman's Guide to Diabetes, A Path to Wellness. Um, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. Um, first, we have Brandy Barnes. Um, Brandy Barnes is the founder and CEO of Diabetes Sisters. Um, she's a diabetes patient and women's health advocate with over 15 years of experience in successful strategic leadership in the nonprofit and for-profit healthcare industry. Her expertise in establishing national patient advocacy and health education programs led her to create Diabetes Sisters, um, a national nonprofit organization um, for women with diabetes. Um, additionally, she has been living with diabetes for 24 years. Um, and also Natalie Strand, MD, a physician who has been living with diabetes for over 23 years. Um, she's m very, very well known um, as part of the first female team to win the CBS reality series, The Amazing Race. Um, Dr. Nat continues to inspire millions of people as a motivational speaker and spokesperson by connecting with the diabetes community across multiple media platforms and providing practical insights on dealing with the daily realities of living with diabetes. She works extensively to promote an active lifestyle in people living with diabetes. Um, so I'm really, really um, honored and proud to introduce them. Um, and I'm going to pass the, um, the speaker over to Natalie now so she can share a little bit of information on um, why Brandy and herself wrote this book for women with diabetes. Well, thank you very much for that introdu introduction, uh, Anna. It was really sweet of you. But um, for everybody here, you know, Brandy and I originally met outside of the concept of trying to write this book. And when we met, we just instantly hit it off because we had that diabetes commonality where you just talk with someone and you almost feel like you're talking to a best friend that you've had for years because you're talking about how you dose your insulin or what your strategies for exercise are, you know, all of the nitty gritty details. And we ended up saying eventually, why don't we write a book like this, a book that not only addresses, of course, the physical issues and the medical issues, but also addresses the entire span of diabetes. So as everybody living with diabetes knows, it's, it's so much more than just what happens in your doctor's office. It's what happens in your marriage or in your job or when you're socializing with friends or when you travel. And so we really wanted to write a book that addressed everything, mental wellness, physical wellness, relationship wellness, and basically a conversation that we would have really, really candidly and honestly, the way you would have it with your best girlfriend if you were sitting on the couch talking about diabetes. So we really tried to put a lot of our personal experiences in the book, as well as you know studies and strategies that are tried and true. So we really wanted to create an easy to read, fun and accurate resource for women with diabetes. And another question that we get sometimes is why is it geared towards women with diabetes instead of diabetes in general? But as you'll see if you get this book and during today's talk, the issues that women face with diabetes and the way we face those issues are different. They're unique to women. Um, so we really felt it was important to have a book that uniquely addressed the needs of women living with diabetes. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, and uh, so we'll go right into um, and we'll go right into our webinar, um, and we're going to let Brandy take um, take control of of these slides for now, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, the mental health aspects of living with diabetes. Well, hello everyone, and thank you, Anna. This is Brandy, and um, so hopefully you can you all can see the slide um, on now that says six stages of diabetes grief. So one of the things um, that I talk about a lot throughout, well, basically throughout the entire book, I talk about the mental health side of things. Um, so early on, I get into this the six stages of what I call the six stages of diabetes grief. Um, back in 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross introduced the five stages of grief, and that's accepted across the board now. But um, one of the things that I added in, in terms of diabetes grief, that I think is missing um, from that standard list is guilt. So just to run through a few of them um, and talk about how this looks in diabetes, and specifically in women with diabetes, um, the first stage is denial, and people don't necessarily just in order um, in and out of the state. So the first one is health, 
you may, uh, a lot of people thought we thought with this, started this, they may, you may be saying things like, oh, I only have diabetes, or the dog didn't have diabetes. Or sometimes they don't say anything because they just don't want to acknowledge the fact that they have diabetes. So if they, you know, say it out loud, then that means that it's real and they actually do have diabetes, so they will just continue with life as it is and try to avoid the fact that they have diabetes. Um, so that's part of this stage because there's a big fear of the unknown. Um, and, you know, of course, from time to time we all have some sort of frustration about our diabetes, but those days are really happy with that. That's one of the things that we really notice about those folks. Um, and like they sort of in the cards. So um, this often gets them in really sort of a vicious cycle of being mad at the world because they have diabetes. A really small network of people that call on when they're feeling bad, and then they blame this on the fact that they have diabetes, and it just kind of goes in a circle, repeating itself. Um, so we do talk about, or I do talk about in this book, some of the strategies to get yourself out of that circle. Um, and if you're in this stage, there you'll probably be saying, "I'll do that," um, and they're often made, you know, really to a higher power like a god. So maybe somebody in this stage would say, "It will, it will take you away. I'll never eat sugar again." Um, so those are those are some of the you know common things that, although they're unreal, when we're in that, sounds like some. Maybe Kate Moore is once she attempted to count how many of the things people with diabetes do on a daily basis and she stopped at 150, which is quite a and it's not really surprising either that women have even higher rates of depression than men with that. Um, but it's, you know, it's also important to really re be able to recognize the difference in sadness and actual depression. And the biggest way to tell the difference in that is if the feeling lasts for longer than two weeks, then it's definitely a time to reach out to a healthcare professional. Um, one of the things that I would say that we've seen um, throughout my experience and my time um, at the helm of Diabetes Sisters is loss of control tends to be a really big contributing factor to, um, oh, sorry, to, <laughs> it tends to be a really big contributing factor to um, higher rates of depression in women with diabetes. So women like to be really in control in lots of areas of their life. And, 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 and. Sorry, we had to make a change. Apparently, I, it was hard to, to hear me. So, people with di women with diabetes really like to be in control in a lot of areas of their lives. And when this sort of feeling of control is lost, um, because they are dealt this blow with diabetes and it's not something that they had any control over, that's where um, depression really takes a hold because they just feel out of control in so many areas of their lives. So um, I kind of compare it to diabetes being an uninvited house guest that has come to stay. And, you know, as women, we don't like to have uninvited house guests, but then here we have this house guest that's never going to go away and we're, we have to deal with them the rest of the rest of our lives. So um, that's a little bit about depression. Now guilt is the one that we hear so, so much about at our conferences because it is so prevalent among women and or people with diabetes, but especially women with diabetes. Um, so I definitely felt like this was something that I could not leave out um, of, this, uh, of this book, really. And it takes up a lot of our time unnecessarily. Um, 
it's and I guess you could describe guilt as that uncomfortable lump in your throat or maybe in the pit of your stomach when you feel like you've done something wrong and a lot of people with diabetes do unfortunately feel like they have done something wrong to cause their diabetes and then there's also guilt that comes along with the numbers so um, you know every time you go to the doctor you get an A1C every time you see a number on your meter or every time you step on the scale there are so many numbers that we deal with that um, there are so many numbers that we deal with on a daily basis that really go into how we feel about ourselves and, and that guilt can weigh on us very heavily and also kind of put us back into that depression stage of grief. I would, yeah, depression stage of diabetes grief. So the last um, phase that I talk about is acceptance and that's really one of the areas that although, you know, there are six different stages so there are people, you know, throughout life there are many more people who are going through all the different five stages and there are many, much fewer of us who are who are actually in the acceptance stage but one of the things I talk about in the book is the fact that um, really you know you're in the acceptance stage when you're at peace with the fact that you have diabetes and you know that there's nothing you can do to change your diagnosis so that's one way to know you're you're there you um, feel a sense of freedom and gratitude that you have the opportunity to shape your own future through your outlook and perspective. So your future is not necessarily defined by the fact that you have diabetes. You know that you have lots of other areas in your life that you have control over and you feel freedom and gratitude that there are so many other things that you have control over. And then the other aspect is you feel a sense of control over your diabetes. And that doesn't mean that you have a perfect A1C or you weigh the perfect weight or you have perfect um, blood sugars all the time that simply means that you feel like you have control over your diabetes and it does not have control over you and then another another uh, sign is that you see diabetes as just another part of your daily life like brushing your teeth so it's not something you wake up every morning and say oh god I got to deal with diabetes again um, so that and, and then I also talk about owning your diabetes in the book and I won't go into a whole lot about that um, on the, on this um, webinar because we're running out of time but um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide and talk a little bit about creating better relationships because that's another really big aspect that I focus on in the book because I feel like a lot of times um, our loved ones get left out of the picture and what they're going through or what they're feeling and thinking isn't necessarily addressed a lot of times and if we could open up those lines of communication and really understand where they're coming from we could really make some headway and just have better relationships not only with our partners but also with our kids and um, with other family members and even with friends and coworkers. so one of the things that you'll find in the book um, is a list of 10 things that potential partners wonder when it comes to having sex with or comes to sex with women with diabetes so um, this is sort of a compilation of things that um, basically my husband has told me that uh, talking to other people and things that people have come up and just asked me um, as I've gone through life. So, um, so you'll see number 10 is one of the biggest, well, so they kind of count down, they count down from 10 to 1 and 10 is the, the one I hear the least and number 1 is the one that I hear the most or the top question. Um, so number 10 is, does having sex with you increase my odds of having diabetes in any way? Um, and although I've never been asked this, this has come up at a number of our support groups. Um, so these are just some of the things that you would never, you may not, I had actually never thought of that. Um, but it is something that people with, people without diabetes wonder. Um, so you'll find some ways in the book to cleverly or cleverly and nicely answer these questions. Um, the question I got the most, or I feel like I've received the most, is can you have sex with an insulin pump on? For whatever reason, men seem to really want to know that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, just some of the general things like why do you have to check your blood sugar so many times? Um, a lot of people, because of uh, media and the things that have been put out there, think that women with diabetes can't necessarily have children, or they think that it might be harder for us to get pregnant. And then, of course, there's all of the Viagra commercials that are sometimes linked to men with diabetes. And so they wonder, will we, will they have to deal with sex problems with us 
like the men in the uh, men with diabetes and all the Viagra commercials. So um, you'll see some of the some of the answers and how to answer in a positive way and keep the conversation going with your partners. There's also one of the other things I do is provide a script for how to really open the conversation with loved ones or specifically partners um, about any issues you're having in the bedroom. And um, then the last. Um, my last slide is um, you'll see it's also about creating better relationships um, and this is actually an excerpt from um, one of the things I did while writing this book was I talked a lot with my husband Chris about um, his thoughts about my diabetes and so this is an excerpt from a letter that I asked him to put together I asked him to write down his thoughts about diabetes as if he were writing a letter to my diabetes and it was just really interesting um, to see what his perspective on my diabetes was and what things affected him the most um, and as you can see from the excerpt um, when he proposed to me my blood sugar was actually low which you know, to me, it, it wasn't as big of a deal. I don't think it was as it was to him, but for him, because he had put so much time into that, and because you know that's a big part of a man's life, um, getting down on one knee and proposing, it, that was something that has really that really bothered him. That I had a low during that time. So you know, um, another thing that we that I talk about a lot is um, asking your loved ones, even your children, some specific questions, um, and I give examples of questions to ask them and I, I think I was most surprised when I asked my daughter um, how often she thinks about my diabetes and to find out that she actually thinks about my diabetes on a daily basis and that she worries about me while um, she's at school I think that was extremely eye-opening because I had no idea um, and just opening those lines of communication has made me much more aware and and open to sharing some information with her that maybe I wouldn't have necessarily shared before um, so with that, I will now turn it back over to um, Natalie, and she's going to talk a little bit about the physical health side of things. Well, thank you, Brandy. And um, as anybody knows who's been living with diabetes for a while, we, we could talk for several hours on the physical health with diabetes. But what I'm going to do instead is um, maybe pick two or three subjects that we address in the book that are some of the lesser well-known um, areas or ways that diabetes can affect your physical wellness. Before I, I go into that, I'm going to share a little bit of a personal story. Um, the educational process about diabetes and how it can affect your body is often one that is met with resistance or that is overwhelming. And I've shared this with Brandy before. When I was in medical school, um, and I'd been diabetic for several, several years by that time, we started learning in depth about every single organ system and every single disease system. And I remember just learning always about, well, diabetes can affect this and it can affect that. And it seemed like whatever it was that we were studying, diabetes was a risk factor for it. So for me, it almost made me want to do sort of a head in the sand technique of, gosh, ignorance is bliss. You know, why would I want to know all this? It's just so depressing. And, and what I realized later was that the knowledge can be kind of scary to look at, but it's also really important because it, it gives us tools to avoid complications. It's not an inevitable path that you're going down. And so when you, when you read about the statistics and you think, oh, this many people may have blindness or this is the leading cause of amputation, and you hear these terrible statistics that people throw out, forgetting that a real human is going to read this number on the other end and not only read the number, but, but you know, automatically analyze when they're going to be part of that statistic. And so I really want to make sure that everybody understands that as you learn about physical wellness and diabetes, it's not to learn about what's in your future. It's to learn about what to look for early. So that if you do have a sign or a symptom of something, that you catch it before it becomes anything more serious or more unmanageable. And that the really good news about diabetes, and we're seeing this in research more and more, is that if you make changes, you can often halt or sometimes even reverse some of the signs of diabetes. So it's not like, oh my gosh, this has started, I have no recourse. And I think that's what a lot of people feel. So 
I just want to make sure that everybody kind of takes a moment after this webinar, sometime in the next few days, to think about, do I really know how diabetes affects my body in general? And is there any resistance? Do, do I want to know? And, and what do I do with that knowledge? You know, to make sure you're in the right headspace to really start learning about the way diabetes interacts with your body so that you can take it into a productive area instead of feeling defeated. And I know that personally I've struggled with that. Um, I think it's a difficult thing. And certainly uh, everybody has their own mechanisms. But with that being said, uh, the first thing that I want to talk about about diabetes and physical wellness is your skin. Um, there are several skin complications that can occur if you have diabetes. The first one I want to talk about are bacterial and fungal skin infections. Um, this is actually a pretty common complication for people with diabetes and usually happens when a bacteria or a fungus can invade a cut or scratch or even just crack skin. So I think most of us know that you know, you're here to check your feet and things of that nature, but what, what I really want to impart is that if you do have a scrape or a cut, don't ignore it and see if it goes away. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got new hiking shoes and I got blisters on the back of my heel on both sides. And I'll tell you what, I was really aggressive with treating those, keeping them clean and making sure I had antibacterial uh, band-aids and I was really keeping a close eye because I know that having diabetes can put me at risk for getting an infection in the area. So as long as we know this, you know, everything was fine with me, but I, I really had eagle eyes for it. And I think my husband even thought I was a little bit crazy why I was so worried about these blisters. But the truth is that when you have diabetes, you have to pay attention to your skin and make sure that if you do have any sort of a bacterial or fungal infection, you're educated about it and that you contact your provider right away. Uh, the second thing I want to touch on is I've got a name that's a little bit difficult to say, acanth acanthosis nigricans. Um, but what this really is is it's sort of darkened skin, kind of velvety, uh, tan or a brown color. And um, it often occurs in areas with skin folds. So we're thinking the bottom of the neck, your underarms, or your groin. So if you do notice areas of skin darkening, it could be related to your diabetes. The other thing is, is that this is often associated with a phase in your diabetes where you may be developing insulin resistance. So if you do notice this skin condition, you may want to also talk to your doctor about whether or not you may be developing insulin resistance and if you need to make any changes in your therapy because of that. Another skin condition is called diabetic dermopathy. And a lot of people often mistake these for age spots. They're just small ovals or circles. And they're pretty harmless most of the time. But you'll notice the kind of a brown scaly patch and they usually appear on the front of your legs in the shin area. Again, it's just good to be aware of what these are. Rarely these can break down and get infected, but usually they're pretty um, harmless and they're just sort of a sign of having diabetes and there's really nothing more to worry about than that. Of course, if you see anything in your skin, like ulcers um, that aren't healing or erosions or any discoloration, that's another thing that you really want to look at because that could be the sign of poor circulation. So there are six tips that I want to share about just overall skin health. And the first one is to be educated. Just learning about the skin complications, knowing what they might look like, knowing what you should look for, all of those things are going to make you all experts at preventing them from becoming anything serious. Of course, um, my second tip is control your diabetes. Keeping your glucose as normal as possible can go really far in preventing these complications. So, um, and if you already are having skin issues, this can prevent them from getting worse. The third tip is for those of us that may be having neuropathy or nerve damage or numbness, you're just going to have to be aware. Um, if you do have nerve damage, you may not feel a cut or a sore the way you would if you didn't have nerve damage. So you should just make it part of your routine to inspect your feet. And I know we kind of hear that and the doctor looks at our feet, but it really should just be part of your routine to take a look at your feet, and including in between your toes. Make sure you catch any blister or cut really, really early. Um, my next tip is to do something about your wounds and sores. So we talked about that already. Uh, the fifth tip is to cover up. And I'm, I'm coming to someone who spent a lot of time at the beach in California. You know, we're, we're tempted often to run around barefoot or in sandals, but if you are going to be somewhere where there's thorns or there's a risk of getting cut, I really suggest covering up your feet as much as possible because, of course, 
rather than dealing with a nasty infection or a cut, uh, it's better just to prevent it in the first place. So um, this also goes into something that we really like to talk about is shoe shopping. If you can prevent a blister, <laughs> that's better than having to treat them. So when you go shoe shopping, make sure you err on the side of having the shoe be just a little bit larger. We want to look for a big toe box, the area where your toes go, those key pointy shoes. Uh, may not be very good for us with diabetes because they can lend themselves to blisters and of course break new shoes in slowly. Um, you don't want to get a pair of new shoes and then go on your family trip. You want to break those shoes in for a little while before you travel so that you can avoid those pesky blisters. And of course my last tip is to practice really good skin care. Um, you want to make sure your skin is not too dry. People with diabetes can suffer from dry skin just like everybody else. But you also don't want it have to have it be moist where there can be skin breakdown. So after you get out of the shower, you want to moisturize, but also make sure that you have time for the skin to dry. Moving on, uh, quickly want to touch on diabetes and hearing loss. This is another physical uh, issue that not everybody with diabetes is aware of. But if you are living with diabetes, you're twice as common to suffer from hearing loss um, compared to people that don't live with diabetes. Now I tell you this not because it's inevitable, but because it's probably associated with high glucose levels and just like glucose elevation can cause damage to the small vessels that go to the kidneys and the eyes, it's thought that the same thing can happen to the inner ear. So um, again, really, really good control or keeping things as close to normal as possible are going to help prevent you from getting into the hearing loss category. Um, some of the signs that you might be having hearing loss are if you have to frequently ask other people to repeat themselves, if you have trouble following conversations in a group, um, if it's more than two people, or if you're in a restaurant, if you're always complaining that other people are mumbling, or certain groups like you can hear men but you can't hear women or you can't hear kids. And you know, I know there's no men on this call probably, but <laughs> I always think that men have a specific hearing loss for their wives, but <laughs> it may actually be true. And then the other thing is if, if people are frequently telling you, you know, oh, the TV is super loud. But if you have any of those things, make sure to talk to your primary care physician. You can go see an audiologist who can do a ear test and a hearing test and certainly um, can help you with fixing that problem so uh, you don't have to suffer with it for too long. And with that, I think I've taken up my 15 minutes. but. Um, now the, the overall point is there are a lot of ways that diabetes can affect our body and we all focus on the heart, the eyes, the kidneys, and the brain. So um, it's important to know all of those, but it's also important to know the smaller things that you need to look for so you can prevent any small item from becoming a bigger issue. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so with that, we're almost to the end of um, the end of the webinar, but before we do, I want to make sure that um, one of the things that uh, is really important for us to get out there is that this book really is for women with di with all types of diabetes across all different life stages. So we touch on everything um, from basically adulthood, early adulthood to um, menopause and beyond. So um, and and some, there are some things that make this book a little bit more unique, the fact that each chapter is sort of a Natalie says and Brandy says so that you kind of hear the focus from um, each of us separately. Um, of course, I focus on mental health while Natalie focuses on physical health. And then there's sort of a key throughout the entire um, book where each chapter has some different sections. There's a uh, notes on my journey section where you can take notes. There's a soul searching where there are specific questions that you can ask yourself and write down answers. And then there are some life application sections um, where it asks you to, to do some things in real life um, or gives you some ideas of how to, how to apply this to your life. Um, and then there's also my diabetes journal sections. Um, so that also off offers you an opportunity to be really interactive. We wanted the book to be really interactive because, it, you know, that helps you get more involved and more engaged in, your, in caring for your diabetes. And um, so that was that was really why we did that. And I also want to make sure that you also know that we do we did put together a great list of valuable resources at the end of the book. So um, one of the things, for example, that we talk about in the book is eating disorders um, and how common they are among women with diabetes. And so there are some great resources for eating disorders, um, but there's uh, great resources for everybody across the board as well. 
So um, you can actually, if you're interested in purchasing our book, you can. Um, it's available now on the American Diabetes Association website. Um, you can see the actual website there, shopdiabetes.com or dot org, shopdiabetes.org. And you can also call the 800 number, um, which is listed there. It will also be in bookstores nationwide on December 7th. So that's um, all of the Barnes and Nobles and Amazon.com and all those sorts of places. So, of course, I want to put a plug in there for you to buy it for someone you love uh, for Christmas. Um, we all have somebody in our lives or maybe even ask someone to buy it for you for a Christmas present. And with that, I want to turn it back over to Anna because she has a um, raffle that she has uh, chosen a uh, uh, winner for. Yeah, well actually, th thank you both Natalie and Brandy. Actually, before we announce um, the winner of our raffle, we do have a question that came in um, during the webinar um, from from one of the women on the call. Um, the question is, um, it's, it's a little anecdotal, but um, I'll put it out there and Natalie, Brandy, um, either one of you can answer it. Um, she says, uh, there are many times after I've eaten a well-balanced dinner that I still feel hungry. How can I avoid this from happening? Natalie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, you go yes. ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, if you're still feeling hungry after dinner, there's a few things I would want to know. Um, number one is, what was your total calorie count for the day? Some people are pretty... Uh, Pretty good at skipping breakfast and lunch and then they kind of get home from work and dinner is their big meal of the day so if you have not been eating regularly throughout the day even if you have a sizable dinner you may still not be meeting your calorie demands of the day so that's one thing I would want to know is our um, our calories being taken in at regular intervals throughout the day and the other thing is is you know what what consists of a well-balanced meal um, some people might think you know having carbohydrates and vegetables and protein are well balanced, but you know it matters what kind of carbohydrate you have and how much of each one you have. Certainly a meal that has a nice portion of protein as well as low glycemic carbohydrates with fiber is going to keep you feeling full longer than a meal that doesn't have those things. Um, another thing that often gets confused with hunger is thirst. So if you're not a very good water drinker, you may want to take that into account. Certainly the more water you drink, um, sometimes that makes you feel full, but also if you stay well hydrated, that can somewhat, somewhat curb some hunger pains that you may have, which is why you hear in every single diet to drink a ton of water. But uh, certainly if you are dehydrated, that feeling of thirst can also be confused for hunger. And the last thing I want to point out is habits. Um, if, as a lot of us are, if you're used to kind of snacking at night as a way to unwind or enjoy yourself in front of the television, you may be craving the habit more than the actual food. So always check in with yourself and see if you're actually hungry. Are you having those stomach growling um, sensations or do you just feel like eating? If you just feel like eating, you may not actually have physical hunger. It may be more of a habit that you just need to slowly break rather than changing what you're eating because it's more of a mental habit than it is a physical need. So that, that's what I would say to that question. Okay. That was a great answer, Natalie. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Um, if anyone on, on the call today has any additional questions, we're running out of time, but you can feel free to send them um, to us at info at diabetesisters.org, um, and then we will route the, the questions to, to either Brandy or Natalie, um, and they will respond to you. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and when you registered, um, we put your name in, um, in a drawing. Um, and today's winner will actually receive a copy of A Woman's Guide to Diabetes, A Path to Wellness. Um, and we will um, reach out to the winner um, shortly after the webinar. Um, and the winner is Corinne Dres Dreskin. So um, if you're on the call, um, you know, um, just be on the lookout for an email from us. And uh, we'll get that out to you early next week. Um, and with that, thank you. Um, happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving next week. And um, thank you for joining us.